Chapter Eight of Our Army at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Army at the Front by Haywood Brown. Chapter Eight. The American Expeditionary Force, which went into the great training schools of France and England was nothing so much as a child who having long been tutored in a program of his own make an abundance of what he liked and nothing of what he didn't should be thrust into some grade of public school he would be ridiculously advanced in mathematics and a dunce at grammar or historian to his fingertips and ignorant that two and two make four he would amaze his fellow pupils in each respect equally and that was the lot of the expeditionary force the french found them backward in trench work and bombing and naturally enough expected that backwardness to follow through they conceded the natural quickness of the pupils but saw a long road ahead before they could become an army then the americans tackled artillery hardest and deepest of the war problems and suddenly blossomed out as experts of course the analogy is not to be leaned on too heavily the americans were not on the instant the arch exponents of artillery in all europe but it is true that in comparison to the size of their army and to the extent to which they had prepared nationally for war their artillery was stronger than that of any other country on the allied side at the beginning of the war notwithstanding that it was the point where they might legitimately have been expected to be the weakest hilaire belloc called the american artillery preparation one of the most dramatic and welcome surprises of the war it must be understood that all this applies only to men and not in the least to guns for big guns the american reliance was wholly upon france and england upon the invitation of those two countries when america entered the war and the readiness of america's men was not due to a large preparation in artillery as such the blessing arose from the fact that the coast defences could be diverted within the first year of the war to the handling of big guns for land armies and thus strengthen the artillery arms sent to france for final training artillery was every country's problem even in peacetime it was the service which required the greatest wealth and the most profound training there was no such thing as a citizenry trained to artillery mathematics was its stronghold and no smattering could be made to do even more than mathematics was the facility of handling the big guns when the mathematics went askew from special conditions these things the coast defence had if not in final perfection at least in creditable degree and the diversion of it to the artillery in france stiffened the backbone of the expeditionary force to the pride of the force and the glad amazement of its preceptors one other thing the coast defence had done it had pre-empted the greater part of america's attention in times of peace and unpreparedness so that big gun problems had received disproportionate amount of study the american technical journals on artillery were always of the finest the war services were honeycombed with men who were big gun experts so when the first artillery training school opened in france in mid-august of nineteen seventeen the problems to be faced were all of a more or less external character the first of these of course was airplane work the second was in mastering gun differences between american and french types and in learning about the enormous numbers of new weapons which had sprung from battle almost day by day the camp when the americans moved in had much to recommend it to its new inhabitants there need be no attempt to conceal the fact that first satisfaction came with the barracks second with the weather and only third with the guns and planes some of the artillery men had come from the infantry camps and some direct from the coast those from the vosages camp were boisterous in their praise of their quarters they had brick barracks with floors and where they were billeted with the french they found excellent quarters in the old low-lying stone and brick houses the weather would not have been admired by any outsider but to the men from vosages it owed a reputation because they extolled in it both day and night the artillery camp was in the open country permit of the long ranges and if it sunned a little enough neither did it rain the guns and aeroplanes supplied by the french were simple at first becoming as to guns at least steadily more numerous and complicated as the training went on the men began on the seventy fives 
approximately the american three-inch gun and on the howitzers of twice that size the airplane service was the only part of the work wholly new to the men and naturally enough it was the most attractive although the officers and instructors warned that an air observation and range finding was by far the most dangerous of all artillery service seventy five per cent of the young officers who were eligible for the work volunteered for it this required a two-thirds weeding out and ensured the very pick of men for the air crews the air service with the artillery was made over almost entirely by the french between the time of the war's beginning and america's entrance all the old visual aids were abolished such as smoke pointers and rockets and the telephone and wireless were installed in their stead the observation balloons had the telephone service and the planes had wireless by these means the guns were first fired and then reported on the general system of range finding was first fire long then fire short then split the bracket this was the joint job of planes and gunners one not to be despised as a feat in fact artillery is of all services the one most dependent on cooperation it is always a joint job but the joining must be done among many factors its effectiveness depends first upon the precision of the mathematical calculation which goes before the pull of the lanyard this calculation is complicated by the variety of types of guns and shells and in the case of howitzers by the variable behaviour of charges of different size and power but these are things that can be learned with patience and require knowledge rather than inspiration it is when the air service enters that inspiration enters with it observation must be accurate in spite of weather visibility enemy camouflage and everything else more than that the observer in the plane must keep himself safe often a matter of sheer genius the map maker must do his part so that targets not so elusive as field guns and motor emplacements can be found without much help from the air finally the artillery depends even more than any other branch of the service on the rapidity with which its wants can be filled from the rear the mobility of the big pieces and their constant connections with ammunition stores are matters depending directly on the training of the artillery men these then were the things in which the americans were either tested or trained their mathematics were a one as has been noted and their familiarity with the existing models of big guns sufficient to enable them to pick up the new types without long effort they had a few weeks of heavy going with pad and pencil then they were led to the giant stores of french ammunition more than any of them had ever seen before and told to open fire one dramatic touch exacted by the french instructors was that the guns should be pointed towards germany no matter how impotent their distance made them long lanes up to twelve thousand metres were told off for the ranges the training was intensive because at the time there was a half a plan to put the artillery first into the battle line in any case it is easier to make time on secondary problems than on primary throughout september while the artillery men grew in numbers as well as proficiency the mastering of gun types was perfected and the theory of aim was worked out on paper late in the month the french added more guns chief among them being a monster mounted on railway trucks whose projectile weighed one thousand eight hundred pounds the artillery men named her mosquito because she had a sting although she had served for three hundred charges at verdun it was not long before every type of gun in the french army and many from the british were lined up in the artillery camp being expertly pulled apart and reassembled by the time the artillery went into battle with the infantry failing in their intention to go first alone but nevertheless first in actual fighting they were able to give a fine account of themselves by the time they got back to camp and were training new troops in their own experience they were the centre of an extraordinary organisation the rolling of men from the camp to battle and back again training retraining and fighting in the circle with an increasing number of men able to remain in the line and a constantly increasing number of new men permitted to come out at the beginning ground out an admirable system before the old year was out the fact that the artillery school could not take its material raw did not make the hitches it otherwise would chiefly of course because of the coast defence and somewhat because the american college men were found to have a fine substratum of technical knowledge which artillery could turn to account 
after all the routine was fairly learned and there had been a helpful interim in the line the artillery practised on some specialities partly of their own contribution and partly those suggested by the other armies one of these the most picturesque was the shattering of the pill boxes german inventions for staying in no man's land without being hit a pill box is a tiny concrete fortress set up in front of the trenches usually in groups of fifteen to twenty they have slot-like apertures through which germans do their sniping they are supposed to be immune from anything except a direct hit by a huge shell but the american artillery camp worked out a way of getting them with luck each aperture through which a german inmate sighted and shot was put under fire from automatic rifles coming from several directions at once so it was indiscreet for the bosch to stay near his windows on any slant he could devise under cover of this rifle barrage bombers crept forward and at a signal the rifle fire stopped and the bombers threw their destruction in all these accomplishments which did not take over long to learn enhanced the natural value of the american artilleryman he became in a short time the pride of the army and a warmly welcome mainstay to the allies major general peyton c march who took the artillery to france and commanded them in their days of organization before he was called back to be chief of staff at washington was always credited by his men with being three-fourths of the reason why they made such a showing general march always credited the matter to his men at any rate between them they put their country's best foot foremost for the first year of america and france and they served as optimism centres even when distress over other delays threatened the stoutest hearts End of chapter eight